Hi, welcome to our daily encounter. In Acts chapter 7, we have uh, Stephen's defense. Yesterday we read about, or read Acts chapter 6, which dealt with uh, Stephen and uh, this great man who was doing great signs and wonders. And he'd gotten in, into some discussions with some people, and they were not able to answer the wisdom by which um, Stephen spoke. And so they began to make up stuff, very similar to what they did with Christ. Uh, began to talk about, well, he's, he's saying blasphemous things against God. And, and basically the two accusations against uh, Stephen was that he speaks against the holy place and against the law. Um, and he says, for we have heard, verse 14, we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place, talking about the temple, and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. So they felt like Stephen was speaking against the temple and speaking against the customs that Moses had handed down. And this was something that was a very big deal to the Jewish leaders at the time. Uh, keep in mind, we got to keep everything in context. As we went through the Gospels, what we found with the religious leaders in the Jewish uh, community at the time was a hyper-focus upon rituals, upon customs, upon uh, keeping the letter of the law, uh, a lot of focus about the temple, uh, exterior things, if you will. And time and time again, Jesus kept teaching that the way of the kingdom is actually the way of the heart. And, and, and taught a, a different approach uh, to God. And then Stephen comes here and, and he's teaching some things and they say, look, he's, he's coming and speaking against uh, the temple when the, the, the exterior things that they held so closely to, held on to so tightly, and then also uh, keeping these customs. And, and Stephen goes on and gives his defense and eventually answers these two accusations that is uh, given against him. But it gives a long background to um, the Jewish history, the the history of Israel. And he and if you look at what he's focusing on as he gives this defense, he's focusing on the land. He starts off by talking about how it was that Israel acquired the land, and then he he transitions to talking about the dwelling places of God. Um, starting in verse uh, 44, he talks about the tabernacle, and then he talks about David uh, wanting to build God a temple, and then Solomon building it. And so he's focusing on these these various dwelling places of God. So they first acquired the land. They had the, uh, well, of course they had the tabernacle before, but they erected the tabernacle in the land that they um, possessed, and then eventually built the temple. But then Stephen, after going through this long history, gets down to the meat of the problem and he answers these two accusations that are given against him. The first one having to do with the fact that he was speaking against the temple. And he says uh, in verse 47, But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you, will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? And so, what Stephen is pointing them to is a God that's much bigger than the temple. A God that goes beyond just the, the stones that were stacked upon each other and, and, and the various gold, the gold that was implemented in the temple and all the wonderful... Uh, adornments that Herod had given to the temple. He's, he's, he's having him look beyond that and say, look, there is a God who is bigger than this temple that you're so worried about. He's the one that you should be thinking about. For so long, God had been replaced by exterior things. He'd been replaced by, um, for one, this temple. They thought, well, you know, if I can just stay in the temple, if I can just do these certain things in the temple and not let the... The wrong people into the temple and do this, that, and the other, that everything is good. Now, that's one of the things that they were focused on, and he's, he's telling them to go look beyond that, look at a God beyond that. And then the other thing about the customs that, that Moses um, handed down, the fact that he was speaking against those things, he says in verse 53, he says, You received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. And so they're so 
uptight about the fact that Stephen's talking about, uh, or at least they were uh, ac accusing him of the fact that he was gonna, he was talking about uh, changing the customs that Moses gave and this, that, and the other. And he says, "Why are you so worried about that? You're not even keeping the customs that Moses uh, gave." And so, uh, again, the the focus in the wrong in the wrong places. And so this is the defense that Stephen says. He says, one, why are you, you know, and of course I'm speaking for him. Hopefully I'm speaking appropriately for him, but trying to look at it from his standpoint, he's saying uh, basically why are you so upset about speaking about the destruction of the temple? And, and certainly that was one of the prophes prophecies that Jesus gave. And it's very likely that Stephen was speaking in line with the fact that the temple would be destroyed uh, in approximately 40 years. Um but he's saying, why are you so worried about that? We're, we serve a God who goes beyond the temple. A God who is so big that you can't fit him inside a building. And then the second thing is, is why are you accusing me of um, altering the customs of Moses when you're not even keeping them yourselves? Um, and, and we could tie in Romans, of course, chapter 3 and verse 23, which says that we've all fallen short of God's standard um, after, Jesus, or after Paul had talked. Uh, some length about how both Gentiles and Jews have all uh, transgressed God's law. That, that's why we need Jesus. But anyways, he's 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 given his defense here, and, and in this defense, I think it's something that we need to uh, realize from time to time and, and be reminded of. Because even in the Christian life, we can get our focus on the wrong things. Uh, we can we can kind of reduce things. We we have a tendency to re reduce things into. Uh, very simple things, simple terms, symptom, simple ideas or simple practices. And we, we focus on those particular things. Um, we might think that, well, you know, just reading my Bible is what it's all about. Or just saying some prayer before I eat is what it's all about. Or just sitting in some pew uh, on Sunday morning is what it's all about. And we forget that there's a bigger picture here. Why is it that we have God's Word? It is a means by which we contact the very God who inspired the Word. Uh, the, the, the Word of God is not an end in and of itself. It's a means by which we get to the end. That is, a relationship with God. And to commune with God. And to have fellowship with God. That's, that's the end result. The Bible is just there to help us get there. But sometimes we can get so focused just on the Bible, we have our heads in our Bibles and we forget to look up at the God who inspired the Bible. Or we get so focused and wrapped up on our ministries at church and we get so wrapped up in uh, just showing up, uh, making sure we have a check mark next to our name in the attendance roll, that uh, we forget why we're even there in the first place, that we're there to worship a God who's bigger than the church that we're attending. He's bigger than just my attendance on Sunday morning. He's worthy of my worship. He's worthy of my heart. He's worthy of my whole life. And dedicating all of that to Him, that's what it's all about. It's not about just showing up on Sunday morning, opening my Bible maybe once a day or maybe once a week. Um, and it's not about just giving some flippant prayers that um, I don't really even think about that much, but I just go through the motions. We're contacting a very humongous God, a God who created the universe. And the scripture says He can hold the universe in the span of His hand. You think about how massive this universe is and how great and, and grand God must be to be able to do that and to be able to create it all and to be able to insert the necessary energies and, and powers to make it all happen. This is a mighty and awesome God that we serve and we should never reduce Him to mere simple practices, simple traditions, um, uh, superficial things. We need to take these words by Stephen to heart. We serve a God who's bigger than anything we can ever imagine. And He's a God who we need to look beyond just the, the, the checklist and things like that. Not that those aren't important to do, but that those are all just a means to get us, again, in contact with the living God whom we love and whom we serve. So these are some things to think about, also some things to put into practice. I do thank you guys for uh, watching the video today. I do love you guys. Hope you guys have a great day. God bless.